Lord be with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CPC's online worship service for Sunday, October 18th. As always, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be with you um, virtually. Thank you for tuning in. A couple of announcements I want to share with you. Of course, <clears throat> each Friday in the church, we send out an email with all the uh, printed announcements, so please always be on the lookout for that and, and uh, read through those, and then you'll be up to date on all the news. I do want to highlight, however, the fact that uh, the session has now extended the suspension of group activities uh, inside the church building now through the end of the year. It was after a lot of discussion and uh, with uh, some regret, but uh, believing that it is the uh, prudent and healthy and loving thing to do, the session has now extended the suspension of inside group activities here at the church through the end of the year. I also want to highlight the special online service that will be coming next Sunday, <clears throat> October 25. Uh, October 25 this year is Reformation Sunday, and in celebration of that, several of the uh, Presbyterian churches here in the New River Valley will uh, come together for a joint online worship service. Uh, the leadership will be provided by uh, different ministers uh, in our area, and uh, our general presbyter of Peach Presbytery, our general presbyter, Carl Utley, will be preaching. So I just want to draw your attention to that and encourage you to tune in for that next Sunday. I think it will be a wonderful joint Presbyterian New River Valley worship service. So again, thank you for tuning in and uh, being with me uh, virtually today for our worship. We will begin our worship now with prayer. So please pray with me. O oh Lord our God, before time began and after all time ends, and in this present moment, you are love. Before our earliest memories, you knew us, and after all our memories shall cease, you will know us still. Show us how to know you in the midst of life and help us place our trust in you fully. Renew your spirit's power within us now and make your presence known to us as we join our hearts and minds in worship. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.
In the scripture reading today, we will find Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem. It's the last time that Jesus was there before he died. And while he's there, there's an encounter with the chief priests and the elders. And frankly, they were getting pretty tired of Jesus. And they want to know, they want to know what gives him the right to go around preaching and teaching. Anyhow, who is he? Where are his uh, teaching certificates? Where, where is his seminary diploma? Who gave Jesus the authority to go around speaking for God? What right does he have to go into an important place like the temple in Jerusalem and set up shop? And so they ask, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? That's the question they have for Jesus. So here's the story from the 21st chapter of Matthew. Listen now for God's word to you. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe John? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? That's what they want to know. Well, in all honesty, it's not just a frivolous question, is it? They're not just being difficult. I mean, it took years of study to become a chief priest or an elder in the, in the Jewish system, years of exams and mentoring and poring over the ancient scriptures before, <laughs> before you could presume to stand before the people as a teacher. But Jesus, well... He's a, a carpenter, and he lacks all the proper accreditation. So no wonder these religious leaders are suspicious about him. Who's to say that Jesus isn't a swindler? How would anybody know that he's not just a, a pretender? And so they ask, by what authority are you doing these things? And actually, that's not a bad question. Think of it this way. Suppose you need a, a, a hip replacement. And you go to see the orthopedic surgeon for a consultation before the operation, and you set the date for the surgery. But on your way out of that doctor's office, you notice the diploma on the wall of the doctor's office. You notice the diploma isn't from an accredited medical school. Instead, it's just a cheaply printed smudged ink certificate from some mail order institution in, in who knows where. Does that comfort you as you head into the surgery? No, it does not. So really, these are important questions that the chief priests and the elders ask of Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gives you this authority? We would expect them to ask these questions. They're suspicious of Jesus, yes, but maybe they're suspicious for good reason because Jesus didn't produce any credentials, no diploma, and no straight answers either. Did you notice that? When they pepper him with questions, did you notice how he responds? He says, okay, you're asking me questions. I will also ask you a question. And if you know the answer to my question, 
then I'll answer yours. Wow. Just so you know, if you really want to frustrate people, then never directly answer plain questions. Turn it back on them. This works especially well for politicians and in disagreements with a spouse. But I digress. Let me get to the point. The question we need to grapple with is, why do we give Jesus authority in our lives? Have you ever thought about that? Why is Jesus our central teacher and guide rather than somebody else? Think about it. Someone who has no credentials, someone who's unwilling to explain himself clearly to others, someone who rarely answers a question head on, why put your trust in him? It's ironic, isn't it? The person you normally would not give a second thought, that's the one we call the Christ. I hope you'll think about that a little. I hope you'll wrestle with that some and, and pray about it because if we find ourselves anywhere in this story today, my guess is that we're on the side of the priests and the elders. We'd at least like to see Jesus' driver's license and do a background check, right? Now, I have to tell you, what I sometimes wonder about is whether we Christians do or do not have an honest faith. And by honest faith, what I mean is a, a non-inherited faith, an, exper an experiential faith, a, a personally owned faith, a faith that, that we have carved out. I wonder about that. Because it seems to me that we can give or claim to give authority to Jesus in our lives without ever examining why. Why is he to be trusted? Why is he the one? Well, some people immediately say, oh, well, he's the son of God. Is that the main credential? If so, how do you know that he's God's son? How do you know that? Some people say, well, it was my parents' religion. That's how I was brought up. Is that the basis for faith? Is that what provides Jesus divine authority in our lives? Because it was our parents' religion? Sometimes people say, well, he's a great moral teacher. Yes, he was. But so was Gandhi, and we're not Hindu. The question is, why Jesus? Have you ever really dealt with or are you just along for the ride? Just a part of the Christian tribe? Have you ever really asked yourself the questions that make your faith your faith, rather than just going along with what others have told you, rather than just belonging to another kind of club that we call church? Allow me to get a little personal. Now, I was taught not to talk a lot about myself when I preach. It's bad form for preachers to talk a lot about themselves from the pulpit. But today, I just want to share a little about why I trust Jesus, about why I've given authority to Jesus in my life. But first, I want to look at that word authority. It has nothing to do with being authoritarian. Jesus has authority in my life, but not in any sort of angry, fearful, pushy, or know-it-all way. Jesus is not an authoritarian authority. The root part of that word authority is author. Author. And an author is somebody who creates or who originates something. A creator an originator. And in the case of Jesus, my experience is that he is an author, creator, originator of the life of God dwelling 
within me. Just like the Apostle Paul said when he wrote, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. That's really what Jesus was all about, bringing the truth of every person's shared identity with God and in God to full consciousness, to full and grateful consciousness. Let me say it another way. Think of it as a journey. Jesus invites us on a spiritual journey to discover the living God within us. And it's a growing, and it's a learning, and it's an emerging, evolving journey. And Jesus doesn't spell it out all in a three-point outline. He leaves things open-ended, sometimes ambiguous and sometimes foggy, because he refuses to be an authoritarian authority whose book you can buy and whose three points to eternal happiness you can listen to on a CD. I think all too often people approach religion as an exercise in listening to some accredited, authorized, ordained, bigwig to tell you about God, to tell you about God, which is okay to a point. But a lot of people can tell you about God. A lot of religions talk about God. The amazing and the convincing thing I think about Jesus is that he lays aside his power. He lays aside his accreditation. He doesn't make a lot of claims about himself. He lays his authority aside for the sake of people like you and me who need to discover God for themselves. It's been said that the greatest need in the church today is for people to know God by more than hearsay. Jesus doesn't want us to know God by hearsay. So he doesn't spoon feed. He doesn't force feed his followers. He refuses to make it all clear and all obvious because it's only an owned faith, an internalized faith, when we unravel it and carve it out and discover it and make it our own. Jesus does not lay claim to his divine prerogatives and powers, and he refuses to exploit his own divine connections because he knew that would just get in the way, that would just get in the way of other people going to God for themselves, for themselves. Sure, he left us certain teachings, yes, but he wasn't looking for passive listeners of those teachings. He wasn't looking for people who were just ooh and ah over his authoritarian version of wisdom. It was by emptying himself of all credentials. That is how Jesus invites others along the path to the living God. The God you get to know yourself within yourself. They asked, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus would not say. Isn't that interesting? He wouldn't say. He doesn't whip out his divine ID badge. He doesn't show a diploma. He wasn't interested. He wasn't interested in having observers or admirers. He just wanted to invite people to join him on God's path. And yes, as we travel that path, we need spiritual guides. We need guides and we need assistance on this journey of discipleship. Yes, that's true. But the good news from Jesus is that we need no authorization. We need no higher approval. We don't need anybody's permission to allow us to set out on the journey. What we mostly need is the will to get on with it. The will to get on with it and do that spiritual work ourselves. Jesus' concluding words in the story are, 
Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The author of life doesn't tell where he gets his authority. But that question answers itself. It answers itself as you follow the path he sets before you. And there is a promise that goes with that. He promises, promises to be with you, to be your companion on that path, to be your companion on that path where we come to know God, where we come to know God firsthand. Amen. Now, please join me in prayer. Ever faithful God, as we turn to you in prayer, 
We acknowledge that we have been drained by another week. We are like a parched desert. We are empty. We need replenishment. We ask you to visit us with your presence and flood us with your spirit. We ask you to bathe us in your streams of living water so that we may know you and be shaped by your living presence within us. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. Oh God, we are not quite sure that we're ready to take the risk of looking deeply within ourselves, looking to see who we really are and who we need to become. So give us hearts of courage. Give us strength for the tasks that lie ahead and cleanse our spirits. Make us truly ready to be your faithful followers. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. O oh God, grant that we may be sensitive to your presence in our lives. Help us to take time to pause for reflection and remembrance. And may we use the freedom that you give us to reach out and to help liberate others with burdens too heavy to bear. Lead us to share the blessings we receive from you and kindle within our hearts a cheerfulness of spirit as we approach each day. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. You are the God of mercy and you bear the hurt of the world. We ask you to hear our prayers for those we know who have special needs this day. We pray for the family and loved ones of Kagan Fisher in their grief. We pray for the health and well-being of Michael and Suzanne Dunn. We pray for Doris Miller, for Letty Scott. We pray for Sarah Akers, for Flora Lawson, and for Estelle Chandler. We continue to pray for Joyce Overstreet and her family and their grief. We lift our prayers for Pam King, for Sandra Clements and Charlotte Davis. Oh God, we pray for Dave Goff, for Mary Jane McMillian and Fran Hart, for Angela Little, for Marty Ludden and Edward Brown. And we pray for Harriet Stockoff and Joe Thompson and Dick Horn. Lord, in your kindness, Hear our prayer. God of mercy, help us to open ourselves to your grace. We ask that you will guide us into a reorientation of our lives in any way that we need true change. And we ask this through Christ Jesus, who showed us how to live and how to love and how to pray. We pray now the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in and being a part of uh, our online service uh, this week. I hope that the coming week will be a good one for all of you. Please know that you continue to be in my thoughts and prayers each day. Now go in peace. As you go, remember, keep the faith, live in hope, and love one another. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and always. Amen.